so I'm going to start up uh, screencasting and, and recording. I'm going to try to do this for every class uh, this semester, including the uh, tutor any tutorials we schedule to make, uh, to make an audiovisual record available. But uh, today I wanted to do two uh, substantive things within um, the span of time we have allotted to us. The first thing is I want to uh, go through some hands-on work with any logic, give you a, a little bit of a whirlwind look at using any logic to interact with the model, to modify that model, run it, and observe results from it. Results that will link in with some of our discussion of the concepts in the later part of today's session. Okay. So um, the sort of model looking at exhibits some of the properties uh, that are important to motivate us to build equal-based models. And we'll try to point those out as we're going through this hands-on example. Uh, secondly, in the later part of this course, I'm going to be going through a discussion, and a fairly articulated discussion, of the agent-based modeling process. Okay, so from sort of uh, soup to nuts, from start and you have some idea and you want to, you, um, you think it may be appropriate for agent-based modeling and you want to think about it, um, about how you might approach it, down the line to building a highly interactive simulation that could be used by non-technical people to get insights into uh, the system they're, they're trying to work with and the, and the policies they're trying to, uh, policy priorities they're trying to adjust, trying to address. So um, that component of today's uh, lecture will probably be larger, um, and it's pretty, uh, pretty concept intensive. I'm going to try to tie it in with particular examples where possible, but it's fairly uh, high level. Now, um, along those lines, I've um, Xeroxed a little bit of material from a book, and it's this book here, which I, which I recommend, this agent-based uh, and individual-based modeling uh, by Railsback and Grimm. That book is, to the best of my uh, knowledge, the uh, foremost book on agent-based modeling available now. There's a variety of others that are circulating, but this seems to me a, a cut above when it comes to learning the techniques. Sure, um, uh, it's Railsback, uh, R-A-I-L-S-B-A-C-K, and Grimm, G-R-I-M-M. Both in the syllabus, right? It is. Yeah. It is. It's referred to in the syllabus as a recommended book. It's not required. However, I am going to be um, uh, indicating for the components uh, of this course corresponding material within this book that you might find useful as a cross reference or as a different perspective on some of the material. Um, so my terminology, my perspective on things is going to differ a little bit from these authors from time to time. They're coming fairly deeply within the ecological modeling literature. They draw on example models, which are much broader than that, but it does shape some of the ways they express things or approach problems. Um, and it's a little bit different from the health focus I'm going to be taking more within this course. So. Uh, it's a great sort of cross-reference to some of the material that I'll present, and it goes into great detail. So um, within today's lecture, I'm going to be referring to a, a system that actually these authors introduced, a protocol known as the uh, ODD protocol. Um, so overview, design concepts, and details corresponding to each of the, the uh, letters in that acronym. And ODD is... Um, a protocol which uh, came out of the, particularly out of the ecological modeling literature, as a way of describing and formulating age-based uh, uh, models, and I find it a very useful, um, useful uh, protocol. And I'm going to be going through some elements of it, uh, but not be able to cover everything. And so this sheet, um, tell you what, uh, rather than me handing that out on an ad hoc basis. One keeping track of who's got it already and not. Maybe you can pass it around, and um, we'll try to make sure everyone gets one by the end. So um, that's going to be for the second part of today's lecture. It's sort of a, a conceptual look at how we do agent-based modeling from start to finish. And 
It's going to be by necessity an overview. There's a lot of material there which I'm just going to be able to touch on so you can anticipate it later in this course. We're going to have whole lectures devoted to topics like sensitivity analysis, like calibration, like debugging models. Um, and those link in with this, this whole broad process, but I'm only going to be able to touch on brief hints of each of them to, to sort of situate them within the broader process, okay, today. So those are the two components. So um, the first component, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a hands-on um, use of, of any logic. Uh, I'm going to um, mention a few announcements now. Maybe you could simultaneously call up any logic. So uh, I'm assuming that most or all of you have installed any logic using those uh, keys I would have handed out uh, last time in our first day of class. If you haven't, pair up with someone else who has any logic there. So you can look over their shoulder at least and come up and talk with me during the middle part of when we have a break. And I'll make sure you get a key, okay? It's a little software key to, so you can activate any logic you have at home. Okay, um, so some announcements. I've been away and uh, we have some work to make up. Well, that has a couple implications. First of all, we have a Friday class this week in addition to this Wednesday class. Not all weeks have Friday classes, this week does. To add to the confusion, it's, it's in a different room. They couldn't schedule the same room. Okay? It's in 446, which is two floors down and right in the area where the elevators are. So uh, show up there on Friday rather than here. Same time. Wonderful. Okay, uh, secondly, I'm going to have office hours. Um, I did have them this morning at the standard time, um, but I'm going to have an extra office hours on Friday as well. Okay? Um, I hope that would be useful to some of you who are either having problems getting any logic set up or thinking ahead of time about your projects. So um, see if you can make use of it. Um, I'll have office hours next week. Wednesday at the uh, slightly non standard. Um, okay, so again, alert me to any issues with any logic. Um, I'd like you to watch these dates. Uh, I know uh, I've been away, so you haven't been able to, to discuss with me a lot, of, a lot of issues, but we do need to get jump started quickly. So I'm having assignment one is formally due this Friday. I'm willing to tolerate hand ins uh, over the weekend. That's fine with me. But, um, like you folks to get going on it on uh, assignment one. For those who haven't done it already, you'll find today's lecture helpful in orienting you towards any logic, as well as Friday's lecture, which will also have hands on components. And then March 9th, I'm asking for term project topic proposal. Towards that end, I, seen, I uh, sent out a list of people in the course um, and uh, divided them into sort of those who are formally enrolled versus those who are. Um, in, the, in another capacity within this course. And I'd like to suggest you, you talk with some of your neighbors to find out if, if you might be able to form some teams. Talk with me if, if you're convinced you want to do an individual project. I'm open to discussion of that, but I'd like to encourage team projects because I think that's where some of the most interesting learning goes on. Okay. Um, oh, the final thing is we have a variety of possible tutorial topics, which I list in the syllabus. I'd like you to look at that. And given your background, let me know if you think any of those um, would be of particular value, particular uh, interest to you. So um, they vary from discussions of health science terminology for those who have you know, never, never encountered issues in health sciences uh, in an academic setting before to uh, discussions of details in Java programming and Java software engineering, to issues having to do with uh, analysis of agent-based models. So um, that's not material I can include in the lectures, but it is material I can put together to, um, you know, outside tutorials on. I have a lot of prepared material for this. So I'm asking if any of that seems of interest to you, send me mail. I just don't have a good feel right now for your folks' background. Maybe all of you are whiz-bang, uh, you know, Java developers uh, during your night jobs, and you don't need any. On the other hand, maybe maybe you, you are interested in more substantive discussion of those issues. Let me know via email, preferably, and I'll send.
set up some tutorials. Okay. So any questions right now that I can I can address just about the administrivia for this course? Nothing. Okay. Um, we can we can talk about it over uh, the break. Okay. So we talked about age-based models last time. Um, it was a long time ago, uh, and. I hope a few elements of it have stuck with you. Um, you recall that within HP-based models, we uh, had populations which are characterized at an individual level, where each agent is captured within the model as a separate entity with some state, some current situation for that agent that may evolve over time. Some parameters which specify characteristics or attributes of that agent that might not change much. And some rules for interaction. Rules for how they evolve. So there's a, a couple of sheets going around there. Maybe we could pass it, continue it on its way around and people could indicate if they haven't received any. Um, these agents are embedded, they're situated in some context. That context typically affords some localized perception. So they may be in a, in a network that represents their friends, their social network. And perhaps their perception of risk is predominantly shaped by those around them within this network. So they're situated in this kind of irregular shaped network. Some people have more contacts than others, but for a given individual, they're disproportionately affected by the nearby people in the network, their friends that they interact with, rather than people further off. So localized perception. Alternatively, an individual may be in a 2D space representing um, perhaps the surface, uh, the Earth surface uh, within the span of the city. <coughs> and they're affected by neighbors within this city. Um, and uh, neighbors who are further away have less of an impact. So they're embedded in some environment, typically. Uh, could be irregular, could be regular. We'll look at a variety of types. And then they communicate. And uh, the typical way they communicate is via something known as messaging. To interact with each other, traditionally with an agent-based model, that's accomplished using a technique known as message packs. So if I am going to impact another person's uh, ideas, say by spreading some memes, some sort of uh, attitude with respect to things, or some, um, some belief, such as belief in the importance of uh, safe sex practices, or, or perhaps it's a pathogen that's going to spread via needle sharing, um, that's, that's accomplished via messaging. I send a message saying you are exposed or you, you have been um, impacted by my, by my uh, comments or what have you. They can also communicate via other mechanisms such as flows, and we'll take a look at models which do that. Um, parking back to sort of classic system, I mean, it's models and stocks and flows. They're situated in, in environments. Um, they have some sort of overall behavior that emerges across agents, but that totals up the sort of behavior of those agents themselves at different levels. So you'll recall that within an uh, agent-based model, we break down this population into individuals, and those individuals maintain their own state, and this allows us, affords us certain advantages. We can represent nested relationships. So in the world, we have people that live in neighborhoods, and neighborhoods which are situated in cities, and cities which are in broader, uh, broader jurisdictions, like states or provinces. And similarly, within our model, we have a corresponding structure to it. We have, we have individuals, and those individuals are contained in referenced by an object which might represent a neighborhood, and that neighborhood lives within a city. So a city will have references to these neighborhoods, etc. And similarly, a, a network of individuals in the world corresponds to a network within, within our model. Um, 
So this is quite some contrast. One of the reasons I emphasized this last time was it's quite some contrast to what we see in aggregate stock and flow models within a system dynamics um, context. So within those models, uh, typically we have division of individuals according to their state. So in a classic susceptible infected recovered model where we are we're trying to understand the spread of infection within a population. People start in a, in a state that, and where they're vulnerable to being infected. They pr proceed to a state where they are infected and indeed are infected in this case. And then they recover uh, from it. We count the number of people in each of these categories. This is a way of organizing information on the population Essentially, we subdivide the population according to the state of each individual. And we count the number of people who are in different types of states. And each of these stocks um, sort of does that sort of bookkeeping. It counts the number of individuals. It's very parsimonious, very frugal from a computational perspective. But it doesn't lend itself very, very well to um, a nice nested organization. So when we have different summaries going on, say summaries of the number of people at the, at the level of the state or neighborhood or city level that are infected, those are all variables within their model, but they're all at the same level. There's nothing that captures their nested status within the model. By contrast, within an agent-based model, what we have is a sort of nesting that goes on. We, we have an organization that mimics, that mirrors what's going on in the world uh, in terms of the relationships between individuals uh, nested within neighborhoods, nested within cities, nested within states or provinces. So um, we have these relationships captured via references. Relationships can be captured within classic stock and flow models using things like mixing matrices. Uh, and so on. I won't have time to go into this in detail now, but suffice it to say that um, it, it doesn't mirror that external structure we see. So agent-based modeling, by capturing and mimicking, as it were, the division we see in the world into <coughs> individuals and, and nested, um, provides us with a sort of intuitive way of describing things out there. Now, our tool for describing uh, agent-based models within this class is going to be AnyLogic. AnyLogic is a multi-platform tool. It runs on Windows, Mac, Linux as three major platforms. Um, it provides declarative graphical languages for characterizing uh, a number of ways of describing a model. So we have graphical languages associated with state charts, drawing on what's known as a UML. Um, form of, of uh, description. We have graphical languages for stocks and flows, which can also um, be used with, with agents. We have graphical languages associated with algorithms. So we can actually describe an algorithm, if then else statements, for example, loops, using a graphical language. Now, underlying all this is, is a programming language known as Java. And it will rear its head and it will be up to you to decide whether it's ugly or a thing of beauty um, <laughs> from time to time. It, it, it will, you will inevitably make its acquaintance. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy the pleasure of its acquaintance, but um, perhaps not all of you will. So there is an underlying uh, language of Java that you will see pop up. Um, and in fact, you'll end up using it without realizing you've used it today. Um, there's a rich language uh, that our library provides of built-in objects that allow for building models quite quickly um, within a, a, a certain, of certain types. And it supports continuous and discrete time and space. Those are fancy words, um, but we'll, we'll see them used with uh, greater precision um, later in this, in this lecture and later in the course. Suffice it to say that it allows you to go time and steps that are very regular, equally spaced over time, like we often use within system dynamics models, numerically integrating a model from time step to time step using delivering an integration. Or we may instead go in 
leaps and bounds according with how quickly events are occurring within the model. Sometimes they occur very quickly, you know, during during a rapidly spreading outbreak, for example. And sometimes we may be in a stasis mode, and they may occur only very infrequently. And we can we can make use of that in, in continuous form to allow for a quite efficient model operation. Similarly, space can be divided up into a in a continuous way. You can get an arbitrarily fine resolution, or in a discrete way, you chunk it up into squares, as it were. So any logic is quite flexible at that level, and it supports a variety of ways of describing model dynamics, semantics, model, behavior of model. It can be described using three popular ways: stocks and flows, characterized, termed by it, system dynamics, agent-based method of description and discrete event. And they can be mixed and matched between models and within a given model. Okay, so uh, stock and flow models are not the focus of this course. Many of you will be familiar with them from uh, system dynamics courses uh, taught here in Sloan. We have agent-based models, um, which uh, are most traditionally described using state charts with transitions of a given individual from one state to another triggered by events or triggered by messages sent by other agents. And those agents can sit together. Sit together in networks, sit together in space, etc. 3D space, 2D space, etc. Um, and we we're gonna take a look at this and finally discrete event modeling where the focus is on uh, <coughs> resources, processes that process uh, typically more passive uh, uh, entities as they flow through the model. Uh, and entities, think of it, say, in a, in a hospital setting, will flow through and undergo diagnostic procedures, undergo operations, undergo um, uh, you know, uh, some sort of workups associated with medical personnel. There's cues by which they, they await, say, access to a piece of expensive equipment like an MRI might have a queue or and um, we have flowcharts which in any logic graphically display um, the process by which these entities are, are treated in secure access to resources and flow through the system both spatially and in terms of the logic. So uh, we're going to actually take a look at this a little bit within this class and talk about how it can be hybridized with the other sorts of models. So those are the three three types. Um, this is an example of a discrete event uh, model we looked at last time. So um, we'll spend some time with hybrid models. These are a big focus of some of my work, and we'll see how they can be used to to build up very powerful components. So uh, advantages of any logic predominantly declarative specification. It hides um, any logic. Uh, any logic hides Java uh, pretty well. Uh, there's less code to write. A lot less code. Even for someone who's a software developer like me, uh, uh, you can keep a, it, it can be quite advantageous to keep a focus on the problem, and the description, the what you are trying to characterize, and get less involved in the details of the how, wherever possible. Uh, there's great flexibility from mixing matching, access to some rich libraries, and arbitrarily rich libraries outside of the uh, any logic sphere. Arbitrary Java libraries uh, support for multiple model types of mixtures. Okay, so those are some advantages, some disadvantages. Uh, well, a big advantage is that's not specified here explicitly, but it's implicit. It's a it's, it's, uh, proprietary platform. It's a very popular proprietary platform, but it is proprietary. Um, it compared to something like Vensim or other system dynamics packages that many of you would be familiar with, it doesn't afford us a nice easy way of retrospectively going back to, to runs we made earlier and reflecting on them and going and, and tracing through the logic, seeing, seeing how variables changed over time. You can do that, but you often have to do a fair bit of building your own little infrastructure for that. I have models which illustrate how you do that, how you record these things over time. It's very important for debugging, very important for learning from a model, very important for, for real insight from all. 
that's not very well supported by the file. Okay. Um, there's bits of Java code you'll need to write. It's, it requires more. Doing in venison. Uh, there's many pieces of the system. We'll start to get a feel for that today. And the debugging version of any logic, if you're going to get it outside an academic context, is very pricey. Okay, so um, that was just a glimpse of what we talked about last time. I'd like now to get us in a hands-on situation. So I'd like us to open up any logic. Can I ask you a question? Please. What did you mean by the so okay. okay, so... Um, so and much of any logic's uh, uh, functionality, and indeed the functionality of, of most other agent-based modeling tools, um, is oriented towards uh, learning from a model, um, inspecting its behavior over time while that model is operating. Okay? Uh, what I mean is, so while you're actually running the model, um, tools uh, afford you considerable access to uh, system state, which, which allows you to kind of go in and poke around and see, okay, what's going on over time, and you can construct graphs that show over time what's, what's happening, right? That's very powerful. So if we have an idea in mind of what we want to look at, if we have an idea in mind of what, what uh, variables might be important, uh, of uh, what components of the model we're interested in, in monitoring. We can put in place mechanisms that display us uh, tables, that display us charts, and uh, run the model. And we might even single step the model through portions of it where we dig down, drill down, and kind of look at, at agents and what the current network looks like and uh, you know what fraction of people are inspected or what have you. Um, Um, and uh, that's well supported. What is not well supported in current platforms is is a easy to use mechanism where you run the model uh, at one point. Perhaps I run it today, and I'm poking through it and looking at the results, and I file it away. I want to file it away, and perhaps tomorrow, or perhaps next week, or indeed a year from now when I get a revise and resubmit of my paper that I wrote based on this model, I'd like to be able to go back and look what, what were my results and trace back the logic of it. Perhaps look at things that I didn't anticipate needing to look at when I wrote that model. To be able to go into arbitrary aspects of model state and, and learn from it. And unfortunately, today's packages just aren't too strong in allowing us to do that flexibly. So they, they are really oriented towards learning as a model runs. Okay. Now, in my research group, we built up a variety of tools, most notably the use of larger scale databases, uh, relational databases to store away this information, that do, that do allow for this retrospection. But they also force us to make some hard choices in terms of you know, what particular things we save away. It's nothing like the ease with which you can go back to a system dynamics model output arbitrarily long from now and inspect you know, what was going on. Any variable within the model, you can kind of go and look at its path over time. And that's very powerful. That, that affords us a flexibility in our modeling that helps our learning. And unfortunately, that's just not there. So long answer to a short question, but I hope that's helpful. Um, Okay, so I'd like you to call up any logic, and I think while we do this, all this is illustrated in the slides, but what the heck, um, I'm going to get my any logic ready as well, and we'll, we'll go through this together. Okay, wow, I have a few any logics here, but this is the one I think you folks have, right? 6.7.1, um, the latest any logic around, and we're going to go through and uh, look at a sample model provided by any logic. So. Once you've got any logic up, I'd like you to go to the help menu, and you'll notice under the help menu there's a thing called example models. Uh, and I'd like you to, to click on that, and you'll see an example model screen, something that looks like, like this guy here. Okay? 
Mine's coming up here, but uh, and I'll 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 show what that looks like uh, in just just a second. Okay, come on, there we go. Um, I'm still coming up. Um, okay, um, so you should should see a slide like uh, a screen like this, and if you scroll down on the right hand side here, you should be able to find something that says SIR agent based. Okay. Um, it, now, the, the layout of this will differ by your screen resolution and so on. So, um, anyone having uh, exiting um, discomfort? Well, there are three. There's SIR, SIR, right. agent based, SIR agent based, and There should be SIR agent based. Just that. Um, uh, so, j j just to sort of mention uh, the distinctions, we will be using SIR agent based calibration in a separate lecture to look at the calibration process, because it's a nice sort of succinct example of how calibration works. Um, but it exhibits uh, a, a number of other mechanisms we don't need today. SIR is, in fact, the same type of system dynamics model I showed earlier, stock and flow model, where we divide up the population into categories. So that was this, oh man, I mistake here. Um, hey, where was it? <laughs> there it is. Um, so there it is, SIR. Okay, um, it's the same sort of model in a uh, deterministic uh, framework, a uh, system dynamics framework. Um, okay, so I'd like you to load that in uh, by clicking on it, okay? So um, here we go, and uh, this is a getting started screen. We can actually get to it more, more quickly there, but we go here, and today it's, uh, it's uh, doing it on one, only one column here, I think. Um, and uh, there should be an SIR agent based, oh, excuse me, I think I may, ooh, do I have to, it, I would have expected to show them all, but um, maybe I have to clip over here. There it is, SIR agent based there, boom. Okay, so, so, uh, okay, it says it's already open because I opened it this morning, okay. So uh, once you clicked on it, you should get something like this. So uh, what you're seeing here, we're going to discuss in, in more detail. But broadly, we have uh, a hierarchy on the left-hand side here, which uh, uh, illustrates the components from which one or more models are built. Okay? In this case, we have only one model open, this SIR agent-based model. And we see the different pieces of it, the pieces out of which we're going to fashion more sophisticated models, so main person scenario, right? simulate what they call an experiment. There's a properties window down here that we're going to make use of quite a bit, and whatever selected is going to have its properties displayed within this component. You'll notice that there are what are called tabs, and here the properties tab is displaying, this is a console tab, um, and you can switch between them. If you double click on one of these, you'll see a full screen, okay? Double click on it again, it becomes smaller. Um, and then there's this palette of pieces that we can use to build up our model. And there's what I call the canvas here, which is going to describe the components of the model that are selected, okay? So, so this is our uh, little world in which we're going to be operating. Um, so we're going to focus within this model a spatial spread, spatial spread, spread over 2D space of an infectious And uh, it's going to start with a single index case, a single index infected, someone who's infectious. Think about someone who lands in Boston Logan Airport, having come from India with uh, <laughs> TB. Um, really? <laughs> hopefully not me. Um, uh, or someone who, who lands from Central Africa with Ebola. Um, they land and they're surrounded by other people and the infection can start towards those nearby them. Um, so we're gonna have a natural history of infection within an individual. <coughs> um, the individual's gonna go from a susceptible state to an infected state to a recovered state, hence S-I-R, okay? And right now there's no 
immunity, waning of immunity. So once you're recovered, you remain recovered. For many uh, infections out there, that's a good description. For some, it's not, and we're going to try modifying this, this, uh, this assumption. Um, and if a given person here is infected, the infection is going to be able to spread from that person to their neighbors in the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and up, down, left, right. In, in the stylized form, we're going to be looking at it. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is double click on person um, in this little hierarchy to the left. So um, I'll call it sweet here. And, and what we're going to see is that when we do that, it fills in this canvas with information and depiction of the mechanisms associated with person, the variables associated with person. Uh, and indeed, it gives down the properties of no information on the person, what we call person class. Class being something that, that describes personhood, what it means to be a person in the in the limited confines of this, of this model, of course. Um, so uh, here we have the, the properties of person. And within this canvas, we have a description of their behavior over time. It's captured in this case by a state chart. We can have many state charts. We could have stocks and flows. But here we only have one state chart. And they have a single variable associated with them, um, the, the graphical color with which they're going to be associated. OK? Um, so this is uh, a person, a person, or to have person. If someone, if an if an object in the model, a given agent, is a person, then they have this sort of behavior associated with them. They, they can be in either a susceptible state, an infectious, an infected state, and a recovered state. And they're going to go through transitions. They're going to go through an infection transition and a recovery transition, okay, um, by which they can progress. Okay, so now we're going to run this model. We haven't modified it, just glance at it, but we're going to right click on, so uh, that's for, for Windows users. For Mac users, I believe it's command click. Um, I go back and forth between the platforms and I can't remember, my fingers remember things that my head doesn't. Um, so I believe it's command click, but it's the equivalent to, to call up a context menu. Um, so uh, you'd right click on it here and you select run. This is an experiment. It's a scenario. It's, it's something that says it, that's used to run the model with a specific set of assumptions. Okay? And we're going to run this model with the default set of assumptions here. So you right click and you click run. There's several ways to run models, but just showing you one of them. And you should get a screen up like this. Okay? Um, this is the gateway to the model. This is the model's initial screen by which we can interact with it. And in many models, we will have all sorts of fields here by which we can put in different assumptions, uh, perhaps indicate where we want the data to be put, perhaps insert a comment about why we ran this scenario, perhaps um, specify some assumption that we would like to be able to change when we're running the model. But right now, it's a very simple screen that just provides a gateway. And all we have to do is we have to press this, this Run button. And you'll get it. Pause for a moment, but you should see something like this. And I'm going to pause this just to let other people catch up. All I did was I right-clicked on that, select run, that thing popped up, I pressed the button, and I got to a screen like this. Okay, so what happens when you push it? I, I'd like to encourage this, this thing for people to help each other get it running. Um, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna describe one or two things here, and if people still need help, I'll I'll circulate and uh, help further. So what we see here is a big space. Um, I believe it's it's roughly 250,000 individuals shown in this highly stylized 2D space, and each of these dots here, each of these single pixels, is.
specifying, is associated with an individual. And the color associated with that pixel denotes the state in which that individual, um, uh, the current state of that individual is either susceptible, infectious, or recovered. And in fact, if you um, may recall, that was the same colors, it turns out, that we used back here, uh, yellow, red, and gray. That was done by convention. There's nothing that enforces that, but um, you may find it helpful to, to maintain that convention in terms of your model. So, so what we have here is a broad space where most people are what? They're susceptible. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is you. Um, <laughs> and, well, hopefully I'm here too. Um, one can always speculate. Uh, <coughs> uh, so uh, so uh, here we have some reds and we have some grays. The grays are the recovered individuals. The reds up here are the individuals who are infectious. Um, and we see a, a pattern where over time the infection started at, at a single point and it's been spreading out. So this, at this periphery, what do we have going on? Why is it spreading over time? Can someone give me some intuition for why is it spreading? Why isn't it just staying statically, this periphery? Why doesn't it just stay where it is? That's right. Why isn't it suddenly reversing and going this way? Yeah, it, it, it can't infect these people, right? These people are recovered. They're either already infected or they're recovered, right? So it's like a wildfire spreading. Um, this is the, the thing that can still be burned. The rest is charred or it's currently on fire, so we can't spread to it. So what we have here is the infection spreading out. It's spreading out irregularly. Why is it irregular? We don't want to hazard a guess. Why isn't it a perfect circle? Yeah. Yeah, there's probabilities associated with it. There's stochastics regarding whether someone is going to get infected when they're exposed to the infection. So had I Ebola, not all of you will be infected. Only some would join me. Um, and uh, therefore, there's going to be holdouts here. But eventually, in the fullness of time, it's a lot less. That's right. Um, there will there will be uh, hegemony. Um, so, uh, <laughs> what what we have here is the the spread of infection out. Now, why is it that we see fewer and fewer reds uh, in the in the middle there. Yeah, because so the further back we go, the longer the time ago typically they were back, and more and more of them have, have reached that recovered state. Now, in terms of stochastics, I had mentioned a stochastic exposure leading to infection, but there's another stochastic here as well, this recovery, recovery stochastic, how long it takes them to recover. Um, so uh, there's a couple of stochastics. Now, we can run this thing out uh, further. And what we'll find is that it actually slows down a bit. I don't know if you have a sense of that, but um, it's, it's not actually running as quickly as when it first started. And that's, that's associated with the underlying mechanics of the model. There's a lot more work to be, to be done when we have lots of agents infected sending these messages <coughs> to their neighbors. Now it's going to speed up some. We have it sweeping over uh, this area, and eventually it's going to reach uh, reach the end. Now, when is it going to reach the end? Well, we haven't we haven't actually got any mechanism of time. So I'd like you to down at the bottom of your model, you can actually select this little uh, this little triangle that's yellow, and you can select model time there as well. And you'll notice that it, it indicates the model time, about 310 right now, that it reached that top, that top boundary. Okay? Um, I'd like you to remember that, 310.
and we're going to see how changing parameters uh, ends up affecting that. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my uh, my uh, slides here. So we added model time in, uh, modified modified that, and we saw how we could use that to, to measure something. Okay, so it took about th 310 time units, this arbitrary time unit we've, we've set up to reach the, the top boundary. And we're going to compare this when we modify some assumptions. So I'd like you to press this red button to stop it. So I'm going to go back to this and, and press it to stop. And it reverts to this screen. Um, because I don't have anything more I want to do with it right now, um, I'm just going to, I mean, we could rerun it. And do you think we'd get the exact same time if we were to rerun this thing? No, again, because of the stochastics. Chances are it'd be pretty darn close because things are going to add up. We have a sum of a large number of random variables that are probably going to uh, sum up to something pretty close to that. But it's going to be a little bit off. But I'm going to close this right now. So just close the window. In fact, I could have closed it rather than stopping it formally. Um, OK, so I'd like now to go back to this. OK, so um, now. We're going to modify this model. And for simplicity, I'm not going to have you save it away. We could save it away. Um, <coughs> where people want to save it away would be different in your particular machines. So I'm just going to, I'm going to modify this model um, in a way that sort of in place. And it's going to complain occasionally because it's going to say, I can't save this sample model because I'm not allowed to. And that's OK. Um, just ignore this, this warning. If you want, you can save it away, and then this, this thing will go away. OK, um, Okay. so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to right click on that simulation. So there's this experiment. Again, we had main. <coughs> oh, your main may not be expanded in this way. Um, you'll notice there are these little triangles next to these things. If you, if you click on a triangle, it's this. This means it's kind of. Uh, uh, not fully really shown, but if you click on it, it will show what's inside of it. And right now we have main done there. But what you're going to do is you're going to remember we have main person in, in this, this experiment, this scenario, this sort of uh, uh, this simulation with certain assumptions. I'd like you to right click on that, and I'd like you to do copy. Okay. Now, if you want, you can copy it using the keys, and that's all fine and good as well. Um, and then I'd like you to right click on the model itself and I'd like you to do paste. Got to keep myself awake. Um, but Chris knows my habits. <laughs> he knows why something's not limited to those cases. Um, so you right click on the model and you do paste. Okay, um, And you should get a second, a second experiment created. Now there seems to be some variability with different versions of any logic as to the exact um, whether this is immediately runnable or not. And, and we'll, we'll deal with the situation assuming that it's not immediately runnable. You'll notice that this, how many people here have a little x next to theirs? OK. You'll notice that x is an indication that there's a problem. OK. So when you see that x, you should you should be aware that there's something that ain't right with the world. Okay, um, probably not news to you, but not right with your <laughs> micro world here. Okay, uh, so you'll see that X, and you'll notice down in the problems view, there's this thing called problems, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and it's down here in the lower left. You see, it says problems, um, and specifically, it's going to alert you to things it doesn't understand, things it has issues with. And right now it says something that is a um, puzzling statement for those of you not from computer science or IT background. Something about the root active object class. Um, but uh, we're going to go through and, and, and see what this means. So I'd like you to click on that new experiment click on it and it, its properties will be shown. And I'd like you to do two things here. The first thing is we're going to rename it to call it slow recovery. Okay. So what are, what are we doing here? We're creating an alternative
alternative experiment. We're creating an alternative scenario. We are, we are creating an alternative um, uh, run of the model which has different assumptions. Okay, so yeah, you clicked on that, and you're going to fill in a name "slow recovery." Okay, we're going to have this alternative situation where we have people. It's still spreading the way it has mechanistically, but it has people have slower recovery than they used to. They stay in for longer. But, and that's one thing we got to do. The second thing we have to do is deal with this little complaint. So specifically where it says this thing next to it, main active object class, it's asking basically what model do I run? Well, in some versions of any logic it's, it's sort of assumed, except you know, if you told it otherwise, that you'd run the same one as you copied from. But in this case, you actually have to say, okay, main, point it to main, okay? So you're going to be running the main class, which is what exactly what this alert sperm did. So those are the two things. And once you do that, it'll be a happy camper, okay? Um, so this problem should disappear here. So there should be no, no problems with it. Okay, the second thing I'd like you to do, uh, any, any questions on that? Okay. Second thing I'd like you to do is to select parameters. So we have just selected general. That's what we were looking at just now, ladies and gentlemen. General. See the general tab down there? Um, and now we're going to be clicking on parameters. And the parameters here are going to be expressing our assumptions with which we wish to run the scenario. So I'd like you to click on that. And here we have right before us a set of assumptions. Specifically, what this is saying is there's an assumption called average illness duration, written in what we know as camel case for the computer science with capital letters that only need words so you can kind of read out. Average illness duration. Um, it was 15. I think you should see 15 on yours. I'd like you to make it 15. In short, we're going to stay infectious for longer, and we're going to have, therefore, a slower recovery. Same, just a different term for it. Okay, the others can leave the same. But you'll notice these, these, are, these are parameters. They're, they're, they're assumptions that are encoded in what are known as parameters of the main class. And I've kind of displayed it here for you. Um, within main, there's parameters, and these are the parameters. So when we have parameters in, in main, the experiment specifies the values to use for those parameters. Now, we have to be specifying constants for all of them. But the truth is, how many people have typed that 50? Welcome to the world, ladies and gentlemen, of Java program. You have just typed your first bit of Java code. That 50 is in fact an expression, and you can have an arbitrary expression there. It could compute the hundredth Fibonacci number and put it into that for the average of this duration. Um, it could obtain the, the current temperature in Mumbai, India, and use that for the average of this duration. Now, that wouldn't be a meaningful thing, but the point is, this could be arbitrary Java code. And in fact, that's what I'm saying when, when any logic hides Java code um, but gives you recourse to it, this is one example of it, okay? So that 50 is, is a, a value. It happens to be a constant here, but it could be an arbitrary expression. And we specified an average illness duration of 50, okay? Um, so we have had, we created here a scenario which uh, specifies a slower recovery. So I'm going to do, for anyone who's, who's gotten lost, I'm going to do this in front of you right now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a right click copy. I click up here, I do paste. Now I have this simulation one. I, I want to be in the general tab. I click here, slow recovery, slow recovery. I go over here, I select main, right? and I go down to parameters, and I press, I type in some Java code. Okay. So that's the value I want to use for average illustration. So, as I said, 
the uh, problem disappeared over here. It was transiently there, but, but okay, I tried to save it just reflexively um, as I am wont, but uh, it complains because it says this is a sample model, I can't save it away. In other words, it doesn't allow you to stomp on the models that come, which is probably a good thing. Okay, um, so I'd like you now to, re to run that slow recovery. What, ladies and gentlemen, so right click on it and choose run. What, ladies and gentlemen, do you expect to be different? How, how should this differ from what we saw earlier? Yeah. Okay, did you have a space between slow and recovery? Okay, no space. Because, ladies and gentlemen, slow recovery is the name of a Java variable. Um, so it actually has to be all one word. Okay? Um, and no funny business with like at signs or stars or, or uh, dots and stuff. Um, so, welcome. Um, okay, yeah, I didn't fly up to John for vacation, although I'm quite comfortable. Um, okay, so uh, we are at the screen here, but how should what we, so we're going to run this, but how should the results of this be different from the early results we saw? The red ring should be thicker. Okay, yes, so why will it be thicker? It's quite correct. Because they stay infected longer, so those that were infected early remain infected and those that one get Good. We should see a thicker red ring. Should it materially impact how quickly it spreads to the to the edge? Okay. Like okay. People recovered so quickly yeah. that they recovered before they had a chance to infect someone. Yeah. Then it would spread more slowly or not at all. But there you go. Okay. Okay. So so some subtleties here. This is really good. Um, so I like what I'm hearing, um, and both those observations are in fact correct. G given the current ranges of it, it's not going to have a material impact. It could in the limit. It's notable from a perspective of, of thinking about an SIR model based on a system dynamics framework, <coughs> which assumes kind of random mixing between individuals in the population that anyone could mix with anyone else. There, are, if you have more infect infected, stay infected for a longer period, you're going to have more infections take place early on, and you're going to have the infection spread much more quickly. So what this is capturing is actually some subtleties in terms of the nature, the spatial nature of that spread that are not captured in that sort of random mixing model. So we're going to run this, and we might even try Chris's great suggestion, making it really, really small. Okay, so we see a thicker, thicker boundary of this thing, and and notably, it's you've got a lot more, lot more uh, individuals within the sort of main disk, which which remain infected. Notice it's running a lot more slowly too, slowly in terms of human time. I mean, in terms of of the actual time we're wa awaiting it. Now, in terms of model time, how do we how do we get the model time on there? Who could tell me what to do? Okay, yes, yeah, so you right click here, you do model time. Okay, there we go. Okay, so it's just simulating more slowly. It's not that it's actually not in terms of model. It's not that it's, it's spreading more slowly in terms of model time. It's just that it's 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 a slower simulation of the process. Okay, so we're going to run this out, and I should point out as we await its, its arrival at the top, this is in what's called virtual time mode, okay? So this is basically saying, run it flatter, run it as quickly as you can, given the processing resources available to you on that computer. Um, there's other modes we can set it to that will throttle it, that will keep it from running as quickly as possible. Why might that be useful? Yeah, so you can watch it. You can, you can observe events that otherwise would go back in the flick of an eye. Right? Um, and uh, so sometimes we want to slow it down, watch things very meticulously. Sometimes we want to just run, have it run flat out. So it's running up here. And it's actually goes slower yet as large, large numbers infected. Basically, each infective here is sending up messages to its neighbor saying, you're exposed, you're exposed, you're exposed. And most of them are pretty useless messages. If this guy sends up messages to his neighbor saying they're exposed, there's not much utility to that, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so we're getting out to the edge here. 
the same amount of time. It's within stochastics of what we saw before. So what we're seeing is more infectives, to be sure, because they stay infected at any given moment in time, there's more infectives. But it's actually not proceeding that much more quickly than the original model one. Contrary to what we might think with a naive perspective on, well, more infectives means more spread. Uh, and what we see is that it does have impact on the sort of simulation time. Sometimes these things take longer. So I just close that, closing the window, um, and I've arrived back to this, to this message here where it's complaining. Okay. Um, okay, so we ran this and we should see something like that. Um, okay, so now we have made a change. We made a change to this model in terms of what? what did, how did we make a change to this? Why is it complaining that it needs to say that? What, we, what did we change? We changed a what? A parameter value. In, in short, we changed the assumption about for how long someone's infected. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll change something more substantial. Something of greater weight. Something that will often have qualitative differences in its impact compared to the merely quantitative differences we saw earlier. That's a, that's a uh, statement which is uh, sometimes true, not always. So what I'd like you to do now is we're going to change model structure, okay? Um, I'd like you to make use of this palette over here. Specifically, I'd like you to click on, so in the palette, uh, you should see several tabs uh, within it, and they, they go by different names. And indeed, you'll be exploring different ones uh, for different models that you want to build. I'd like you to click on the state chart palette, okay? So in other words, in this palette window, I'd like you to click on state chart sort of tab, and it should expand to a set of components under it, okay? Um, showing them, okay, so only one of these can be open at a time. Okay, um, so we clicked on the state chart, and I'd like now you to add, I'm gonna ask you to add a new transition. Specifically, um, I want to add a transition that will allow people to lose their immunity. So that instead of folks being recovered in perpetuity, we're going to have people losing their, their immunity. Um, so some of those people who were for a long time uh, recovered will, will become susceptible again. So what I'd like you to do is Look over here, you should see something that says transition. And I'd like you to drag it over until the, the end from whence the arrow springs. Gosh, this type of English also is which I will not put. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the origin line, the origin dot of the arrow um, uh, should, should land on, on recovered somewhere. It doesn't matter if it's here or anywhere else on recovered. The interior for coverage. So I will do this in front of you to illustrate this. It may sound hazardous, but fear you not. Um, so I just, see, I dragged it over, right? Um, and I can click anywhere here. You'll notice it is turning green. That has import. That is important, it turns out. It means there's a good connection, okay? You see, you see that thing is green there? Um, the thing on which my arrow rests. Um, Okay, so there I clicked it, okay? And now what I'm going to do, uh, ask you to do is to drag it so it rests on susceptible, um, the other side, the, the arrow side. And it doesn't matter again where I drag it to on susceptible, okay? I'm gonna drag it over here and it looks kind of crooked. Um, so I'll, I'll drag it like that just to, but that's, that's a matter of aesthetics. Um, which is not my strong um, So, uh, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, so, uh, what you'll find is that the two ends are connected because they're green. That's a sign that things are A-OK. -okay. Um, think of it as green light that allows you to proceed. You'll notice if you're slightly off, watch this. Don't do this yourself. <laughs> right? If you're slightly off, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, 
it's going to be white. And there are times where, because of the way that these things bend, that you you actually think it's connected, but it's not. And you can you can diagnose that by the color. Okay. So I've, I've added this connection, and it has a singularly uninspiring name, a singularly opaque name, a singularly unclear name, and um, that too is something up with which I will not put. So uh, we're going to change this transition name to be waning immunity, okay? So this is, you'll notice the properties are displaying that because that's the thing that is selected, that is now selected. And I'd like you, when that's selected, okay, yeah, 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 boom. Um, you should type waning immunity, okay? Um, now, if I were to be really picky, I'd probably say, be consistent with these, it should be a capital W, uh, but I'm not gonna go through such niceties right now. Um, and it's saying press control enter to perform refactoring, um, which you don't need right now. We'll, we'll explore the Im implications of that at some other point, but suffice it to say, now you don't need it. So you type waning immunity, all one word. So this is a Java variable name, and you press enter, okay? Um, and, uh, and by the way, we could also do show name. See this thing, show name? Do you see what happens when I do that? <laughs> um, so, uh, We'll, we'll kind of drag it up next to it, okay? So that's waning of immunity. Now, so we've just added a transition that captures the fact that an individual who is recovered can now go back to a susceptible state, right? Okay, so what we have to do though is to change the assumption about it. So I'd like to, to set the, to have this be a timeout, to have it be a, what this will mean is that it goes off at a fixed amount of time. After you've been recovered for exactly an amount of time, you'll, you'll lose your immunity. I'd like you to keep it there for now. We could, we'll discuss the implications of that later, whether it should be a rate, a certain chance per unit time, regardless of how long you've been in that state, or an exact amount of time, or some other, some other thing. We can, we'll, we'll talk about that in a later class. But I'd like you to set it to 100, okay? To, to a time, so you lose immunity of 100 time units. Bearing in mind, it took about 300 time units to reach that end. So that's a fairly substantive amount of time, okay? Um, okay, now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we've really done there is created a new model. Before, we were changing assumptions with which to run an existing model. True or not? True. Now what we've done is we've actually modified the model. So if I were if I were doing this at a serious level, I'd save this model away as a new version. I'd keep the old version, make sure that that you know that version is retained in case I have to go back to it. I create call this a new version of the model and make sure that all my documentation about model results, it's annotated what version of the model they're for. So I don't mix, oh, did I did I run, was this the result from running it with the earlier version of the model or the latest version of the model? You don't want to get in that situation. You want to keep really clear documentation. We have a tool that helps us do that, but you can do it manually too, and it's highly advised. Okay, so I'd like you to run the original simulation. Oh, yes. Why doesn't it show up now in parameters? Okay, that's a good question, because it's actually not a parameter. It's, it's actually a transition. It's a great question. There was an Listed a piece of data associated with it, 100, right? But that's, we didn't make that a parameter. We just, we do what's, what's termed hard wiring it or hard coding it. We, we just specified it was 100. Um, we didn't, in fact, turn it into a parameter. So this thing here, this waning immunity transition, it's not a, it's not a parameter. It's actually a, it's actually a, a thing that's, that's a transition instead. We just specify a value here. Well, Good practice would be, instead of saying 100, make it a parameter and refer to that parameter here. And then it would be much clearer. Um, we could see very, uh, with great transparency, what our assumption was just by looking at the value of that parameter. We could use that parameter in other places, record it to a database, whatever. Um, but this, this is just a value we specified here. It's not a parameter set.
Um, yeah, for, for the reason I'm not doing it here is because it turns out that if we added a parameter and referred to the parameter here, it would it would have an additional step, which would kind of could distract from the learning that's going on here. And secondly, it turns out there's a little bit of mechanism we'll be getting to that will that's involved, and I didn't want to distract people with sort of having to think about that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So <coughs> the structure changes apply to yeah. all simulations. Correct. But the parameter change Correct. can apply to different simulations. Correct. So, so the um, so these experiments are each associated with a, a specific set of assumptions with which to run them on. That's local to each of those. So, a given experiment has a particular set of assumptions with which to run them on. And and creating a new experiment doesn't in any way change what was assumed for the other experiments. Here, changing the model by adding a piece of structure suddenly is going to change the, 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 the structural assumptions, as it were, under which all these experiments are going to be run. So that's why I say it's best to save away the models a new name, like you know version 2, version 3, because you want to be very clear when you have results for model runs with what version of the model they were run. Right? Um, so actually, for example, in my group we'll save away model version number in the database when we have model results that come out. So we're very clear what were the assumptions of parameters and what were the structure what was the structure of the model that's being used. Okay? These are two different things. Well, you cannot set up on a true name. Um, you can actually. You, you can? You can. Um, so if you wanted to within this model you could actually have a main one and a main two where main one was the original structure and main two was the separate structure. But um, in this case, you'd actually, it wouldn't be main, it would be person one and person two. But. Okay, so great, great questions. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the original simulation here with this new, new Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see some results from this. How should they be different? The original set of parameters on so this is not slow recovery, but how should it be different from that very first run we did? People can lose immunity. If there's waners, and it, so it's going to have something to do with kind of the relative timing of how people get recovered after getting infected, on the one hand, and how long it takes them to lose immunity. Because if it's long enough that there ain't no wane, there there ain't no infected people around anymore, it doesn't matter. They're going to be susceptible, but but they're not going to be at risk. So it'll it the infection will spread and will die out and everyone will end up in that original state. And here we go. Were there waners? Yeah. There are waners associated with that word, word text. So what's this? What, why do we see that inner ring? What's going on there? Sorry? There's a repeat cycle. That's right. So these are the folks who got infected once, got better, and are now getting reinfected. And we see this internal one spreading out as well, right? Um, so over time, it is spreading out. So I'm, I'm pausing and restarting uh, this. And what we see is actually little secondary outbreaks here where it's sort of seeded by different infectives that were around, right? And if I run this in the fullness of time, what do you think we'll see in the center again? Yeah, it'll be another wave of infection right there, right? Um, is this going to impact how quickly it reaches the boundary, you think? Not really, no. Um, should probably reach it around the same time. We can go verify that here. Yeah, it's getting around 300 again. But, but what we see now is something that qualitatively is quite different, right? That original infection eventually would have led to what? I should have run it out, you know, let it run out um, for, for a long period. Uh, 
it would have led to a space that was all one color, right? And what would that color have been? Gray. This is going to lead to, talk from the stochastics, a chance that maybe some, if you ran this out, you know, 100 million years, maybe there'd be one wave which just didn't, which didn't in fact catch and so on. But what we see is here broadly, it's going to be a self generating set of waves, right? One change to model structure, big implications for the qualitative behavior. So, ladies and gentlemen, riddle me this. What we see here is quite sophisticated waves. Where are those waves in the model? Where is the fact that they're roughly brown? It's an emergent thing. It's an interaction between a heck of a lot of different things in the model <laughs> concerning the natural history of infection, how quickly one goes from one state to the other, how likely it is that a person will spread to their neighbors, uh, you know, the, uh, the length of time it takes to, to recover as well, to, to uh, lose immunity. Um, there's, there's assumptions about to whom messages get sent, whether it's just your north, south, east, and west neighbors, or it's all all eight neighbors around. Yeah. So what if you just went east and west? Would you get kind of a, a bad thing? Right. That's right. If you just went east and west, what, what do you think <laughs> would happen? That's a great question. Well, it wouldn't go north and south. It wouldn't go north and south. <laughs> All you have is sort of a wave, a 1D wave, right? It would be kind of going up like that. And, and the rest would stay successful. Now, if it went to north, south, east, and west, compared to northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, north, southeast, west, do you think that would make a big difference? Yeah, I think th that's my sense. It's something that you want to check, and there's actually a process in agent based modeling known specifically as robustness checking which checks that. It sounds like an innocent assumption, right? It sounds like a, a trivial assumption, a, a minor detail. And chances are, in this case, it won't make any difference, but it's worth checking. And in fact, any logic supports both neighborhoods and it'd be a straightforward thing. Um, okay, so now what we have is emergence from a very simple model. And indeed, one of the big motivators for agent-based modeling, harking back to its origins in Los Alamos National Labs and so on, was the fact that there are many very, very uh, sophisticated, uh, intriguing, rich, textured patterns we see out there in the world. Think about things like sand dunes um, that, that beg for explanation, but the explanation is often lies in extremely simple phenomena interacting. Very simple phenomena that interact lead to tremendously rich patterns. A second thing that you'll see here is something that goes by the name of, 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 sort of phenomenology uh, when it comes to modeling. What we see here is waves. We see waves of infection. And you know, we can measure exactly at what speed these are spreading and how big the secondary infections are, how many infectives there are within each each wave and so on, but fundamentally what we've, what we've captured here is something qualitatively different from what we saw when we began with this model. And we've captured a, phenomenolo a component of phenomenology that, that is reflective of something like rabies in a way that the original situation wasn't. And there's something important there that transcends the, the, the detailed quantitative match. To what degree does this really quantitatively match? how rabies spread, we've reproduced a phenomenon, a broad phenomenon of waves of infection, oscillations. That's important. It's important. And agent-based modeling, um, like system dynamics modeling, appeals as much to issues of sort of qualitatively matching things. There's importance of that that goes beyond just sort of mechanically measuring, you know, the R-squared um, 
correlation with, with some, uh, some observed pattern. We're, we're capturing important modes of, of system behavior. So this is a simple model. We've modified it. We've modified the assumptions numerically. We've modified the assumptions uh, in terms of the, the structure. I'll leave it as an exercise, which I go through in the slides, on, um, on the faster recovery, you know, how they would interact with faster recovery. But that was a, um, that was sort of an example of the use of, uh, of any logic. So a couple sort of take home points from this. Uh, first of all, we've seen a glimpse of any logic use for any We've seen how actually there's a graphical depiction that allows you to fill in values, as it were, fill in little snippets of what turns out to be Java code, that 50 that we changed, any of those numbers we saw. Those are really snippets of code, and um, we can, yeah, we can fit them into a graphical depiction that's surprisingly robust. We built quite sophisticated models using this, and we don't, you know, one of my fears with any logic was to what degree will this nice graphical interface break down? And you really need to build a serious industrial type model to what degree will it really hold up? And the answer is it actually holds up very surprisingly well. So, you know, it's, it's encouraging. Um, we've also seen that you know, when we see complex phenomena in the world, the explanation doesn't have to be super complex itself. We can sometimes get a lot of mileage out of interaction of very, very simple pieces. Right? And that's really what a lot of system science appeals to. It's an issue of, of connections. Going beyond the individual pieces in isolation, oh, those are two simple things, and seeing that their interaction is actually, leads to the origin of very important phenomena. And this emergence, tell me, ladies and gentlemen, do we see emergence within classic system dynamics models, stocks and flows? Mm -hmm. You bet you do. It's the interactions there between particularly stocks and flows, right, that leads to rich emergence over time. What we've seen here, though, is a little bit different. We have seen how spaces can be filled, you know, with rich emergent patterns. So we've seen that spread spatially, but also has patterns associated. Now, we could have plotted out the number of people infected over time for that. And we'll see how to do that very easily in any logic. And that was dynamic emergence, emergence over time with respect to aggregate variables, very, very well captured within system dynamics. But here we've captured spatial components. And in fact, we could have done it with a network, right? Instead of having a rigid 2D space with only connections to your nearest neighbors, which is awfully stylized. We could have had a quite sophisticated network space or a 3D space where you have some chance of you know, infecting those two squares away, three squares away, or what have you. We could have had agent movement within that space, all sorts of different things. And the point is we get emergence not only over time through interaction of aggregate variables, but over space and over topological structures like networks. So modifying the model quantitatively can significantly change results. Modifying the model structure can qualitatively change results in an important way. And I'll actually note that um, in deference to, uh, to Chris, that he's absolutely right that if we took this to the limit and we were to modify that um, that parameter assumption about how long people stay infected to be small enough. In fact, you could get something qualitatively different. And it was alluded to earlier. You could get the infection never spreading at all, never seeding. Or, or so I should be more careful now. It would seed with very low probability. So, you know, 99 out of every 100 model simulations you run would not spread at all. And then that one out of the 100, that would spread. So, um, there can be qualitative changes caused by parameter values, the tipping point phenomena we see within system dynamics models. But here we have emergence due to interaction between agents in a way that's very hard to capture actually within an aggregate model. Interagent emergence, which is the focus of so much of agent-based modeling. 
Okay, um, so that's all for sort of the first little component of this. Um, and we're about halfway through here. So what I propose is that we take a 10-minute uh, break. And um, I'd be glad to uh, speak with people, and we can, uh, we can reconvene in, in 10 more minutes. And we'll continue on uh, discussion of the agent-based modeling process from start to finish. Okay. Thanks very much. And I'm going to stop this recording. Should we close this model? Um, yeah, the model needs...